we've carried a series of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And I know our young people have been in some of these and not in some of these. And, of course, with everybody's schedule, uh, you've come at different times. But we do have all of these on CD and DVD. They're on our website. And, by the way, I've gotten lots of feedback from people in our church as well as visitors and uh, even people from around the world that uh, are following our website and following our, um, our lessons. Um, and it's really exciting to see what the Lord is doing there. In fact, I had, we had a visiting family Sunday that said, we really like this church and we've been listening for several weeks on the website before we decide to come. So it's become a tool of outreach and it's uh, become an opportunity. Uh, if you have to miss a service, then it's available to you. Now, I don't think it's a wise idea just to skip, just to skip. I have this little theory that when we do what we can do, God will do what we cannot do, and he'll make up the difference. So if you're sick, maybe you're shut in for several weeks and you can't do anything about it, but you can pray, you can worship, you can listen to the preaching and teaching, and God will give you spiritual strength and feed you. You'll be right on track. But if you miss those same two or three weeks just because... You're busy, you're lazy, you got to do this, you got to do that. Uh, then that same principle doesn't really hold true. You can't count on God's grace to make up the difference when you have not taken advantage of the opportunities that he's placed in your life. There's just a principle of God's word that God will not do what we can do, but he will do what we cannot do, and he will make up the difference in our lives. So, so uh, perhaps... Uh, many of you have not been in every single one of these, so I'm going to just briefly summarize and bring this to a conclusion tonight. But we understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That simply means God manifested in the flesh. There's one true and living God who created us. He created us to have fellowship with Him, to walk in holiness. But through sin, we as human beings broke that fellowship, that relationship with God. God could have justifiably just gone on. He could have incinerated planet Earth or he could have wiped out every living human being and started all over or just forgot the whole project. But instead, he loved us. He wanted to have relationship with us. And so he paid the price for our sins by God himself coming in flesh as Jesus Christ. We understand that Jesus is both God and human at the same time. He's not a second God. Because there's only one God. And God does not make little gods. We say the Son of God. We're not talking about a new God popping out of the old God. But we're talking about God coming in a new way. And that is in the flesh. According to the flesh, when Jesus was born as a baby, he was the son of Mary, the son of humanity, the son of, uh, of man. But he was also the son of God. Because it was God's spirit who actually caused the miracle of conception in the womb of a virgin. But don't suppose that Jesus is a different God or a different personality. But he's the one true God revealed in the flesh. And so we spent some time talking about that Jesus is truly God and also he's truly man. He's human in every way just like us except for sin. He was innocent, pure and holy. He did not partake of sin, did not have a nature of sin. But he was human in body, he was human in mind, human in will, human in soul, human in spirit, whatever terminology you would like to talk about, not only the outward physical body, but the inward personality of humanity. Jesus had all of those characteristics as a full human, but not separate from God. We cannot think of God and Jesus as two different entities, but we must think of God and humanity united in the one person of Jesus Christ. So that when Jesus died on the cross, he died according to the flesh. God's spirit cannot somehow die, but in the flesh, Jesus died. The spirit that was in him took on that full extent of human suffering. And so it was God himself who became our savior. And Jesus Christ died for our sins. He paid the price. He was buried in the tomb. He rose again. And we've talked about how his resurrection has given us victory over death, over sin. 
over hell, over the devil. And so whatever you're struggling with tonight, whatever you're battling, whatever comes against you, I want you to know that in Jesus Christ, you can have victory. Amen. I'm not saying you're exempt from temptation. Jesus was tempted. I'm not saying you're exempt from suffering. Jesus suffered. I'm not saying you are exempt from persecution. Jesus was persecuted. But I'm saying when the world does its worst, when the devil does his worst, when uh, your own flesh tries to go against the will of God, you have an answer, and that is in Jesus Christ. Through the blood that Jesus Christ shed at Calvary and through his spirit that he pours out upon us, we can rise above everything this world has to offer, and we can be victorious. You may not feel it at the moment, but Jesus didn't feel victorious when he was crying out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt the utter depths of despair. But yet in the midst of that despair, he knew that he was doing God's will. And therefore his last words were, It is finished. And then, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So even in those awfulest hours when he felt forsaken, he was yet able to end up saying, I trust God. I give my life to God. As a man, he was a model and an example for us. And even though he went through that bitterness of despair, if anyone ever uh, didn't deserve to be punished or to die, it was Jesus Christ. But yet he felt the agony of despair and defeat. Yet he knew in his heart of hearts that he would be victorious. And so he could say, as we need to say, God, I give myself to you. I commit my spirit into your hands. I put my life into your hands. Even though it seems like I'm at the bitter end and there's nothing else to do, I put my trust in you. And that trust was vindicated because on the third day, the spirit of God came back into the lifeless body of Jesus in the tomb and raised him from the dead. And he was transformed into a, a glorified body. Amen. And now I want to talk about the ascension and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. We talked about that a little bit last time that his disciples actually saw him go up into heaven. And by his ascension, he resumed the power and authority that he had as God Almighty. It's amazing through the incarnation, by God coming in the flesh, God didn't change who he was. His identity, his nature, his character remains the same. Yet God somehow became something he never was before. That is a human being. And so God added that dimension of human existence to his eternal nature. And now he is forever God manifest in the flesh. To me, that's incredible to think that God loved us so much that he was willing to permanently enter into the human race and become part of us. Now, when Jesus ascended to heaven, uh, he is no longer visible to us. He's no longer in our dimension or our temporal universe, but that means his spirit can be manifested everywhere at the same time. And so that's why we are now in the age of the Holy Spirit, where God promised his desire and his will is that he wants to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Every human being now has the opportunity to receive the Spirit of God. Amen. Well, let's talk a little bit about the ascension and the exaltation of Jesus. When he ascended to heaven, he was exalted. And what that means is, while on earth, he was a humble servant. While on earth, he submitted to the will of God. While on earth, uh, he was not recognized by the general population as anything extraordinary. Uh, in the sense they did not understand who he was. The casual observer just saw him as another man. It was only with the eyes of faith that they could discern his true identity. But now he's no longer in the role of the humble servant. Now he is in the role of the conquering king and the Lord over all. And that's how we understand him. We understand he is still human. We understand he is still the son of God. But he's no longer in the lowly servant role. He's no longer in the suffering role. But he is once again in the role of Almighty God. That's why we worship him. That's why we call upon his name. 
Now, throughout his human life, from birth onward, he was God manifest in the flesh. But now he has publicly resumed the prerogatives of that role for the whole world to see. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, and I'm using again the uh, New King James. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now what is it saying? On earth he was a humble man. On earth he submitted to the will of God. But because of his faithfulness as a man, because he fulfilled God's plan, He did not sin, but he obeyed God's will. He died. He was buried. He rose again. Therefore, the Spirit of God has exalted him. That man, Jesus, who was visible on earth as a man, he is more than just a man. But he has been exalted to the place of highest honor. He's been given the name which is above every name. Now, in the Old Testament, that name was Jehovah or Yahweh. But I want you to notice... The name of Jesus is Jehovah Savior. So when it says he's he's been given a name above every name, notice that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Now someone may say, well, the highest name is Lord or God. Well, that's the highest title, but it's the name of Jesus that's of utmost significance. In other words, the point is not that everybody is going to worship a Lord. It's not going at the judgment that, Everybody's going to acknowledge that there is a Lord, but specifically everyone will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. As an illustration, you know, the highest office in the United States is the office of president. But when it comes to the signing of legislation, the legislation is not effective just if somebody puts president on the signature line. Barack Obama has got to sign the name Barack Obama in order for that legislation to become effective. It is the office of the president that's supreme, but it is invoked by the name of the one who holds the office. So it is the name of Jesus that has been exalted above all others. That the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess of things in heaven, things on the earth, things under the earth. And so we either confess him now in salvation or one day in the judgment, if not before, we every one, the demons, the angels, humans, the saved, the lost, the sinner, the saint, all will acknowledge Jesus Christ is the one true Lord. Amen. Now, when we do that, that does not deny the Father, but that gives glory to the Father because the Father has chosen to reveal Himself to this world in the name of Jesus Christ. Going a little bit further to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 through 22. Now, this is speaking of Jesus as the glorified man, who He really is. It's talking about the things that God did, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Now, it says that God has seated him at his own right hand. Uh, Some people take this very literally. Theologians usually do not. Uh, even Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestant Reformation, he wrote, if, if you think that Jesus is seated on some golden chair, uh, literally at the right hand of another person, then you misunderstood the passage. Because God is a spirit, John 4, 24. Sp- uh, the spirit is invisible, John 1, 18. No man has seen God at any time. Uh, if you expect to go to heaven and see the spirit of God, you're mistaken. God's Spirit is here right now, but we don't see Him. While we're talking here tonight, no doubt there's a church in Houston having service and God's Spirit is there. No doubt there's a church in New York City and God's Spirit is there. So God's Spirit is everywhere at the same time. If you talk about God's right hand in a physical sense, where would it be? Would it be in the U.S.? 
Would it be in New York? Would it be in California? Which way is God facing? You know, would it be if he sits on the North Pole? Is it on the right-hand side or the left-hand side? You know, which way is it? Well, obviously, that question doesn't really make sense when you talk about a spirit. But we're talking about a position of power. Now, in the Greek language, the the right hand was a, a metaphor for power. And even in English, we see this. In most languages, there's, there's some reference like that because most people are right-handed, and you know how it is. And if you're left-handed, just think in reverse here. But if you're right-handed and you throw the ball with your right hand, you try to throw the same ball with your left hand, usually it's a pitiful failure. You know, if you write with your right hand, then suddenly you have to write with your left hand, it's practically illegible. If, if you try to throw a punch with your right hand, uh, it's probably more effective than the left hand unless you practice, unless you uh, learn how to overcome that natural weakness. So just in an ordinary human expe- expression, the right hand signifies power, signifies ability, um, dexterity. In fact, the word dexter is Latin for right, the right hand. You, you have dexterity, you have skill, you have ability when you use the hand that it has the most ability. And so we use in English the term, uh, he's my right hand man. In other words, that's, my, that's the one that does the work for me. And so the right hand is a position of power. What this is saying is God, you know, it's looking for the point of view of, of the apostles who knew Jesus according to the flesh. They saw him as a real live human being who walked about, who went to sleep, who ate. And just think how incredible this revelation was to them. They knew at, at the beginning that he was an unusual man. They knew he was a great teacher. And, and soon they knew he was a miracle worker. But that's still a far cry from fully understanding God manifested in the flesh. And I really think it was the resurrection that finally pulled it all together undeniably. They must have had some understanding before. But I think as Thomas confessed, when he saw the resurrected Christ in John chapter 20, verse 28, he said, my Lord and my God. It finally all fell into place with a full revelation. No matter how great somebody is, it would be hard for you to say, well, that's God. Everything within you would fight against that, especially if you're a Jew taught, don't worship idols, don't worship false gods, don't worship images, worship the one true God. And so the magnitude of this revelation comes out in this expression when they say, you know, this man, Jesus, that we all knew about, this man, Jesus, that we all saw, we saw him die. But then we saw him raised from the dead. We saw him go up to heaven. That Jesus that we saw, that man who was one of us, who ate dinner with us, who slept in the bottom of the boat with us, that man has been exalted to the right hand of God. In other words, he's not only a man, but he has all the power of the invisible Spirit of God. He is in the position, the right hand position of glory. He is in the position of power and authority. And so this is exalting Jesus, not saying, oh, by the way, he's in a second place. See, that wouldn't even make fit the context, would it? He has a name above every name. He's the junior person. That's not what it's talking about. What it's saying is he is in the exalted place. The highest way you could think of him, that's where he is. And so he has power, all principality, all power, might, and dominion, every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also that which is to come. Everything that would come against us has a name. And whatever would come against us, whatever label you give to it, the name of Jesus is higher. So if you think of temptation, you think of addiction, you think of lust, you think of alcohol, you think of adultery, you think of fornication, Whatever you think of, the name of Jesus has more power than those sins or those evils that come against you. You think of mental illness. You think of cancer. You think of heart attack. You think of demons. I want you to know the name of Jesus is more powerful than all of these things. We call on the name that's above every name. Amen. I'm not willing to give up hope. 
when it comes uh, to anything other than the will of God because the name of Jesus is higher than anything else. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. Praise God. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Jesus is the head, we're the body, and the enemies under our feet. Under the feet of Jesus means under the feet of his body, the church. Now, when Jesus arose and ascended to heaven, he resumed his visible glory and his divine prerogatives. He had divine knowledge while walking on earth. He had divine power by, while walking on earth. But he voluntarily submitted to human li limitations such as getting hungry, getting thirsty, getting weary. But no more. Jesus, after the resurrection, he ate with his disciples, but there's no indication he had to eat to live. There's no indication that he took a nap. There's no indication that he got hungry. And so in heaven, and when he returns, we will see him as a true human, but we will not see him with any human limitations. He now operates in the position of divine power and authority with all the prerogatives of God. Acts 2.33 Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. So here we see Jesus as pouring out the Holy Spirit, which is his own spirit. Jesus is pouring out his spirit to us. Acts chapter 2, 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. You see, at his birth, he was the Lord. The angels worshipped him. Uh, the shepherds worshipped him. But he was not really known to be the Lord. But by the resurrection and ascension to heaven, he is declared before the whole world that he is the Lord. Amen. And when he comes back again, the whole world will see this. As an example, in Revelation chapter 1, uh, the apostle John had a vision of Jesus. Now, John was called the beloved disciple. He was best friends with Jesus. And he actually had the, the closest position of leaning up against him at the Last Supper. And when the other disciples were wondering what's going on, they said, hey, John, ask him. And so John had the inside track, so to speak. Uh, now, so here's the guy who could feel comfortable leaning up against him at supper and saying, Lord, what are you talking about? Who's the one that's going to betray you? Best friends, you know, confidants but when john was on the isle of patmos and he had a vision of the ascended christ notice what happened when i saw him i fell at his feet as dead but he laid his right hand on me saying to me do not be afraid i am the first and the last so notice the dramatic transformation his best friend saw him in glory and fell down as if he were dead he was overwhelmed by the presence and power of God. So I'm saying Jesus is exalted. Even those closest to him notice the dramatic transformation. When Stephen was stoned in Acts chapter 7, verse 55 and 56, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And notice what he said. Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Of God. In Acts, just a few verses later, 759, they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now, some suppose, well, he saw God sitting down and he saw Jesus standing up. Again, I've told you that literal picture is a mistake. How can you see an invisible spirit? And where's the right hand of an invisible spirit? If you're going to be very literal, I thought Jesus was sitting at the right hand of God. So I asked some people, they said, well, he stood up to welcome Stephen. So that, that's a little weak, you know. That, that just shows how, you know, is he sitting? Is he standing? Is he sitting up, getting up and down every time somebody dies? You know, what, what's the deal? Well, I think it's a mistake to think in those terms. Notice it does not say that Stephen saw one person of God, and then he saw another person called Jesus. But actually what he saw is the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What I would understand, he saw the glow, cloud of glory 
And in the midst of that cloud, he saw Jesus. Yes, he did see Jesus because Jesus has a glorified human body. You can see Jesus. And so he saw Jesus, but not as he appeared to be while on earth in his daily walk, but he saw him in the position of power. So you can imagine Stephen seeing Jesus in this glorified position saying, it's amazing, I, saw, I see the Son of Man. In power, I see the Son of Man in the position of authority. I see the Son of Man standing up with power and authority. And that's, that's what he was describing. I see the glory of God. And I see Jesus in the right-hand position. Again, it's not a physical position of two bodies because when he actually cried out, what did he say? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. If he actually saw two different persons he would have called on two different persons. He wouldn't have ignored the most important person and addressed the lesser person. But he called on the one person whom he saw. And that is an example for us even today. Now, if you think I'm getting a little carried away by this description of the right hand, let me give you some examples. In Exodus chapter 5, verse 6, talking about how God had delivered Israel from Egypt across the Red Sea and how the Red Sea had swallowed up the Egyptian army, uh, as the, uh, the Israelites were praising God, they said, Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. Now, did they see a giant hand come out of heaven and scatter the enemy? No, they saw the Red Sea cover up the enemy. But they described that metaphorically as the right hand of God. Or in other words, the power of God did this. Likewise, Jesus himself, when he was on trial before the high priest, Matthew 26, 64 to 65, and they were questioning him. Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further do we need? Do we have a witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. Now what was Jesus saying? You're going to see me at the right hand of the power. Speaking of God. But notice it's, it's power. The position of power. And coming in the clouds. Now do you think Jesus was saying, When I come back, you're going to see two people coming back in the clouds? And I'll be on the right hand of that one. So now if you're looking from America, it's going to look like the left hand, but it's really the right hand if you look from Jerusalem. Is that what he was saying? No, he wasn't saying you're going to see two people coming back in the clouds. He was saying you're going to see me coming back in the clouds. But when you see me, it will be in the position of power. It will be the right hand of power, the right hand of God. It's not going to be like you see me right now, but standing before you in a trial in the middle of the night. Uh, ridiculing me and mocking me and slapping me, but you're going to see me as the Almighty God. And that's why the high priest said, blasphemy, blasphemy. He wasn't just saying, well, you, you know, you're going to be an exalted man flying around next to God. That wouldn't necessarily be blasphemy. But he, the high priest understood indirectly in Jewish terminology, Jesus is claiming, I'm the one who has all power. I will be at the right hand of power. I will be coming as God. And he said, that's blasphemy. You're claiming to be God. And so he accused him because he couldn't accept that. Now, Hebrews 8.1 says, now this is the main point of the things we're saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And this is speaking of Jesus in his exalted role. Now, what difference does that make to us? It makes a lot of difference, but one thing is... The role that Jesus has. The present effects of the cross. In Romans chapter 8 verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen. Who was even at the right hand of God. Who also makes intercession for us. Now again. Do we get a, a literal picture here. Of Jesus is on his knees praying to someone else. He's at the right hand of someone else and he's on his knees praying for us? No, I don't think that's what he's talking about. What it's talking about is this intercession that Jesus accomplished on the cross is still applying to our lives today. If we sin today, we have an advocate with the Father. We have uh, 
a, a savior, a mediator. It doesn't mean Jesus has to pray. It means his one sacrifice on the cross covers all of our sins. Notice in verse Hebrews 5 and 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears, to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. So in the days of his flesh, that is when he was subject to the limitation of the flesh, while he walked on earth and he obeyed the will of God, he submitted to God, he prayed. During that time, he prayed. He doesn't need to pray any longer because he's not submitting to human limitations any longer. He is glorified. He is in the position of power. There's no one for him to pray to. Two, because he has reassumed the prerogatives of Almighty God. In John chapter 17, verse 20, here's an example in the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed for you and me. He prayed for his disciples, but then he said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So his prayer at that time even extends down to us today. So I want you to understand that when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and that when he died on the cross, it was not only for the people living at that time, but for everyone who would believe on him through the word of the apostles. And we believe on Jesus through the word of the apostles as recorded in the New Testament and as we preach and teach today. So the prayers of Christ extend to us. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross extends to us. There doesn't need to be another sacrifice in the 21st century. Jesus doesn't need to come down and kneel down and pray for us in the 21st century. His work was done on the cross when he died. He said, it is finished. Now, there is an ongoing intercession through the Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus will come inside of us and will motivate us to pray. And sometimes we're praying in tongues or we're praying with groanings which cannot be uttered. It's actually the Spirit of Jesus that's motivating us in our prayers. But He doesn't have to physically come down and kneel uh, here and pray on our behalf. He already did everything He needed to do and He sat down. In other words, it's done. It's finished. Okay. In uh, Hebrews 10, 12, notice how it's expressed. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And here, notice the emphasis on sat down. What is it showing? It's finished. Again, we're not talking about a physical thing where Jesus is confined to a corner. He's got to sit in a chair for 2,000 years. He can't get up till the second coming. What he's saying is not that. What he's saying is he finished the work. He's no longer in the role of a humble servant. He's no longer hanging on the cross. He's no longer kneeling in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. But it's finished. He sat down at the position of power. And from that role, as thinking of him as ruling and reigning as Lord over all, he can take care of all needs simultaneously because of what he already did for us. And his intercession now, as I've already explained, is through the Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, the work of Christ as far as the mediatorial role or the sacrificial role, the work has been done, but the benefits are ongoing. And so we can say even now, He is the Son of God. He is our mediator. He is our Savior. He is our advocate. He is our sacrifice. Not that He has to do anything else, but we can still come to Him today and we can plead the blood. When we say we plead the blood, we're not asking for Him to shed any more blood. And we're not offering the, the, the uh, Lord's Supper as shedding more blood. But we're saying the blood that you shed on Calvary, I'm applying it to my life today. I'm calling upon what you paid for back then. Imagine it as he put a multi-million dollar bank account there. You're still drawing the money. He already put an infinite supply in the bank. He doesn't have to keep doing it. But we can still keep drawing it in time of need. Praise God. 
So we need to understand that he is exalted. He has won the victory. He is in the position of all power. He's paid the price. What we need to do is to appropriate the benefits of Calvary. We need to look up to our Lord and say, Jesus, you're Lord of all. I need you tonight. Hallelujah. I need your blood to cover me. I need your victory in my life. I need your spirit to guide me. Hallelujah. So the true significance of his ascension, his exaltation, is he is able to meet every need. He is Lord of all. The world doesn't see it now. When he comes back to earth, the whole world will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. But we get to see that now. We acknowledge him right now. He's Lord of all. Praise God. And so while we worry about the economy, we worry about um, health problems and, you know, what if a flu epidemic covers the earth. We worry about what's happening in politics. We worry about wars and rumors of wars. Yet we go a step above all that. And we say, Jesus is ultimately in control. I'm on the Lord's side. And whatever happens, the Lord's going to take care of me. Amen. I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm believing on the Lord. And one of these days, he's coming back for his church. I'll be caught up to meet him in the air. Praise God. Amen. Everything we need is in Jesus Christ. Praise God. So I hope that in these lessons you can see what we really have in Jesus Christ. We have salvation in the full sense of the word. And we have our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise God. Now, before I go any further, I know I've touched on a lot of subjects and some perhaps uh, unusual or unknown or uh, uncommon. Although it's all in the Word of God, I've tried to give you lots of Scripture, but it has been a fast pace at some points. So I want to pause here. Does anyone have some questions or comments, something I've said, or something maybe I didn't say that you have questions about? I know some have called me and emailed me, and maybe you've already gotten your questions answered. But if not, I wanted to give you time to think about it. So, a little change of pace. Can we do that? I'm not sure. Everybody's just kind of stunned here. Yes, Brother George, is that you raising your hand or your Bible or something? Yes, after he arose, of course, there were the nail scars in his hands. Of course, I don't regard that as limitation. Now, I will say he has a real human body, but his spirit still goes everywhere. So in that sense, he's not limited by his body. Uh, I see the uh, scars as identification and uh, a reminder of what he did for us. So to me, it's not a limitation. It's an identification. And... Of course, the difference between a wound and a scar, you know, a wound is still hurting. It's still uh, unhealed, but a scar is healed. It's no pain, no hurt, but it's a reminder of what happened. And in that sense, it becomes a trophy of victory. So I would regard it as like a banner of the battle we fought and we won. Of course, Jesus won. So that's how I would interpret that. Yes. Yes. Well, let, let me respond to that in 1 Timothy 3.16, which you quoted first. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And here's what I understand. The mystery of godliness is not really how many gods there are. We know, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's a clear statement of Scripture, Deuteronomy 6.4. It's uh, reiterated throughout the Bible. Jesus himself quoted that in Mark chapter 12. Verse 29, but the mystery of godliness is that God was manifest in the flesh. And that is truly something that our human minds have a hard time understanding because how could someone be both God and man at the same time? We understand what it is to be human. We have some understanding of what it means to be God, but how can you be both? Because God is eternal, humans are finite. 
God is all powerful. Humans are, are limited in power. You don't imagine God getting hungry or thirsty, but yet Jesus got hungry and thirsty. So how could he be both at the same time? That is the mystery, but the mystery has been declared and revealed that God was manifest in the flesh. And then the other passage you alluded to in, in Matthew 16, where uh, Jesus asked the disciples who people were saying he was, and then he asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah, but he says, you're the son of the living God. When the Jewish perspective That doesn't mean you are a different God than the one we already know, but somehow you are the son. You are the human personification or revelation or manifestation of the one God. And Jesus said, that's right. You know, and flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. So it is a supernatural revelation from God. But let me say this. The revelation is given to us in scripture. So, We're not talking about an extra biblical revelation. We're not talking about the angel Moroni coming down and revealing this to you. You know, we're not talking about uh, some uh, spiritual experience contrary to God's word. We're talking about when you study God's word, when you read it, when you pray about it, you compare scripture to scripture, you listen to preaching and teaching, you're hungry, then God will use that word to open your understanding to truth. Amen. Amen. Another word we might use is illumination. That is, the light of God's word shines in your heart. Or you might think of God's spirit as lighting up the word. Have you ever noticed this when maybe before you were seriously seeking God, before you received the Holy Ghost? The word of God was dead and dull and difficult to understand. But when you're filled with the spirit, suddenly it becomes alive. It becomes real. It makes sense to you. So it's a revelation of the word of God to your heart. And yes, every one of us needs that personal encounter and understanding and insight, illumination, whatever term you want to use. But notice it's not outside the word or contrary to word, but it's through the word of God that we receive this revelation of who Jesus is. And of course, there are many... uh, different ideas all throughout human history. There are many different labels that are used. But what I've tried to focus on in this series of lessons is Jesus is the one true God, but he's also a true human being. And deity and humanity are not separated him, but united in him so that he's both at the same time. And why is that important? Only as God does he have power and authority to save us. No one less than God could save you. But only as a human could he take our place and die for our sins and shed blood for us and rise again. So he had to be God to have the power. He had to be a man to do the work. He had to be both to be the Savior. Praise God. Amen. Someone else. Yes, sir. Right. Yes. First Corinthians 15. Let's go there. And this is probably uh, one of the most difficult passages for everyone to fully understand. And let's see if we can understand its meaning. First Corinthians 15. And let me go to verse 24 to give you the full background. First Corinthians 15, 24. Then cometh the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. It's talking about Christ. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he, and that's referring to God, has put all things under his feet, Christ's feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he, that's God, is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, when you read the first few verses, it's easy to understand. 
that Jesus Christ is gradually defeating the forces of evil. Of course, he defeated them on the cross, but it's still being implemented. So uh, eventually, Christ is going to come back to earth, establish his kingdom on earth, and then after that, there will be the last judgment. And so at that time, all the enemies of God will be completely judged, and the, the kingdom of God will be complete throughout the universe. So God is using... The, the instrument that God is using to win the victory is the man Christ Jesus. God has used the Messiah, the anointed one, as the means of destroying the power of death, destroying the power of sin, destroying the power of the devil. So that's gradually happening even now. From the cross onward, it's gradually, you know, the kingdom of God is advancing from heart to heart to heart. But eventually it will be complete throughout the universe. One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. So what we might say is right now we're living in the kingdom of the Son, the kingdom of Christ. In other words, Christ, the anointed one, the, the heir of David, the son of David, the son of Abraham, he is in the process of establishing his kingdom. But the reason for him doing that is ultimately to lead everyone who will receive him back to relationship with God. So in a sense, the humanity is just a vehicle or a vessel to reconcile everyone back to God. So right now we're in the temporary kingdom, the kingdom of the Son. But the goal is to go back to the eternal kingdom where everything is at peace and harmony under the rule of God. And so that's why it says the Son himself also will be subject, that God may be all in all. Now, if you think of these as two persons it really becomes very difficult whether you believe there's one God or whether you believe there's three persons in the Godhead. The classic Trinitarian view of three different persons that are co-equal, co-eternal. Well, that wouldn't fit very well with this because it has the Son being subject to the Father that God may be all in all. In fact, the people that on the surface like this the most are the Jehovah's Witnesses because they teach there's only one God and they teach that Jesus is not really God and he's going to be subject to God in the end. So this would be one of their favorite verses. But it, So if you take it as a separation between God and the Son, that's where you would end up. You'd end up as a Jehovah's Witness um, or in ancient history it's called the Arians. But I think that's a misunderstanding of the Scripture because the role of the Son is temporary. God... Uh, took on this role to save the human race. But after the last judgment, there's going to be no more redemption. There's going to be no more mediation. There's going to be no one pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. There's going to be no one asking for forgiveness of sins. It will be over. So what I see this as saying is the kingdom of the Son will end that God may be all in all. So I would paraphrase this by as saying that God will no longer act in His role as Son. Although the incarnation is permanent, his glorified body is permanent, the w results of his work are forever. You know, we're saved forever. He's a, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, meaning his work is finished, it's done, it's complete, and it lasts. It will never be overturned. But he will stop acting in the role of the Son. He will no longer be merely the human ruler of the human race that restores uh you know, God's plan to the human race. You know, even now, we're looking for the millennial kingdom where Jesus will rule on earth as a human king and fulfill all the promises that God gave to Israel. But we're talking about past that. In eternity, there will be no more role left for, for God to be manifested as the Son. But He will simply be who He was before creation that God may be all in all. Now, if that sounds like a, a little bit awkward way to do it, we're talking about some eternal concepts here. And we're trying to get back to viewing God as he was before we knew him, before creation. But here's another way to look at it that uh, I think is a, a similar statement, yet in very different terms. And that is in Ephesians chapter 5. So in 1 Corinthians 15, you have the Son giving the kingdom to the Father that God may be all in all. And I'm saying Jesus Christ fulfilling his role as the son in his last act as the, the human ruler of the human race saying, I give everything to God. God is all in all. And so we're back to simply understanding the, the rulership of God over the whole universe. But in Ephesians chapter 5, 
in verse um, 26 and 27, this is talking about Jesus Christ loving the church, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And here's the key verse, Ephesians 5, 27, that he might present it, and that's how I'm presenting the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So in 1 Corinthians 15, the son surrenders the kingdom to the father that God may be all in all. In Ephesians 5, 27, Jesus presents the church to himself. So those are two different pictures, but it shows you we're not talking about one God giving everything over to another God. We're talking about God doing the work in the flesh until it's finished, until his church has been established, until the last judgment, and then God is giving the church to himself. And so those are two different ways of looking at it. The main thing is... Jesus had to come in the flesh. God had to come in the flesh for the redemption of the human race. Once that's over, once that's done, then God will simply be what he was in the beginning. With the one qualification, since he came in the flesh and he adopted a human body and he was resurrected with a glorified body, he will be eternal in that role, in that body. Even though he will no longer be in the role of son, no longer be a mediator, a sacrifice, there will be no need, but he has chosen to become one of us. And to me, that's what's exciting. That he didn't do a temporary fix, but he permanently identified with his creation. And I, that's why I see the marriage analogy is so good, because he's chosen to marry us. He didn't choose to, to be with us for a little while and move on to better things. But he says, I'm forever uniting myself with my people. Praise God. Praise God. Well, let's summarize this tonight, and here's, here's the goal. Somebody shut me off here before I was through, so turn me back on. Okay, let's see if I can get from here to there. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, here's the summary of it all. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking for. And notice it's one God who is revealed as our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, 9 through 10, For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. Everything we need is in Jesus Christ. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him. Therefore, whatever we need, we find in Jesus. And so in Jude 25, this prayer, To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So in the end, we give all glory to God for what he's done for us. Let's stand together. And once again, I want to appeal if there's someone that you need the touch of God in your life tonight. If you need God to work in a special way in your family tonight. If you need healing. If you need to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You don't have to wait till another time. But in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. And we can go to Him because He has provided for all of our needs. He has given us the victory. Let's praise him right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us the victory. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice, your death, your burial, your resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that you've ascended, you're exalted, you reign on high as King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. We exalt you. We glorify you, Lord. We praise your holy name. We call upon you in time of need. Hallelujah. You're at the right hand of God. The position of all power. Hallelujah. We acknowledge that tonight. And we call upon you. Who needs the touch of the Lord? Would you come? Who needs the miracle working power of God? I want you to know the name of Jesus is above every name. Whatever you're battling with tonight, call on the name of Jesus. Whatever you're struggling with, call on the name of Jesus. 
Do you need forgiveness of sin? Call on Jesus' name. He will forgive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you'd like to come and pray, please come right now. Amen. Call on the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. If you want to be dismissed, you can be dismissed at this time. If you'd like to come and pray, please do so right now. And we'll be glad to pray with you.